Yeah. Let me uh, tell you how this uh, work began. Uh, it began uh, several years back uh, when uh, Stan Williams and some of the folks um, in his lab uh, came to talk to us. They had some interesting work going on in devices. And our lab is primarily about architecture and systems. And so th they wanted to know, you know, were these things useful? Uh, what direction should we go in? What could you do with these devices? And so we began a collaboration back then. And, and a lot of this work is basically a collaboration with uh, his lab and the people in his lab. So with that, um, let's step back and look at what are the some of the uh, future uh, system design challenges that we have looking forward. Well, the, the biggest one by far is power, both on chip and off chip. And for each of these bullets here, I'm going to be uh, following up with a slide with more details. Both those, uh, the on chip computation as well as communication off chip. Uh, the second problem is the end of classic scaling. Uh, and again, I'll go into each of these in more detail later. Interconnect bandwidth at all levels. And uh, the corollary of this really is power. So bandwidth isn't so much a problem if power isn't a limit. But if power is a limit, then uh, it's a much bigger problem. And we know power is the number one problem. And programmability is a big concern. So we've got, uh, you know, we're not making uh, cores faster in terms of single thread performance uh, or significantly faster anymore. And so we're just getting more and more cores per die. And we have to figure out a way to program them. And we want to do that in a way that's efficient in terms of concurrency. So if we get more efficient computation substrate by having a lot of parallelism, but we have inefficient computation, uh, that really doesn't help us anything. And then finally, re resilience is a big issue going forward. So as uh, we get to smaller and smaller devices, uh, errors are more likely to occur and there are more devices in the system. So the combination of these things can really reduce the uh, time between system uh, failures. And so that requires what we believe uh, a role for both interesting hardware techniques and innovative software. But I'm not going to be talking about that today, but I just thought I'd bring it up. So uh, in terms of power, at current trends, uh, exascale systems are uh, expected to consume more than 100 megawatts in 2018. And if you have uh, a nuclear reactor uh, associated with your organization, that's OK. If you don't, uh, that's a significant power wall. And uh, I, I've given this, uh, this slide at num numerous places, and I'm always proud of our, our California um, national parks. So that's uh, Yosemite there. So where does the power go in terms of computation? Well. If you look at it in terms of the actual, what you think of as the computation, it doesn't really consume much power. Double precision floating point operation is 50 picojoules per op. Even if you want to get data out of a small level one cache, uh, that's not much. That's 33 picojoules. Uh, a larger L2 cache that's a little further away uh, might be shared. Uh, that's some more power, but it's still out of line. The really big power is accessing a DRAM, basically going off chip. So this brings forth a couple of questions. Since this is the big term right here, how can we both uh, reduce data movement and make what data movement we have left consume less energy? And uh, if you're interested in the source for this data, it's in the um, uh, study documents for the DARPA Ubiquitous High Performance Computing uh, Program. And it's available at that website. OK, so the end of classing scaling, I, I think we're all kind of uh, intuitively familiar with this. But in the old days, uh, you used to have a design at a certain uh, feature size. And you, when the fab process got better, uh, there was a scaling by um, 1 over square root of 2. Uh, you could just basically oftentimes fab the same design at that smaller feature size. And then we had to start making more and more changes. But uh, scaling. That way doesn't work anymore. In fact, what happens is you've seen with, uh, for example, high K gate dielectrics, uh, because the oxide on the gate was getting too thin to scale anymore, we have to come up with new technologies that we have to insert. And a lot of time, there's a lot of um, delays and trouble uh, coming up with a new technology and getting it to work uh, in very high volumes and also to be reliable over the long term. 
So instead of just simple scaling now, when we want to scale, we have to come up with uh, tricks and then new tricks at each for the next generation. For the next scaling after that, we have to come up with yet more tricks and better tricks for the generation after that and even better tricks. And then finally, you know, there's a saying that anything sufficiently advanced uh, appears like magic, so we need magic <laughs> tricks out here. Okay, so the third big problem is the pin bandwidth wall. So why do we have a, a pin bandwidth wall and, and how hard is it? Well, since the, the root of the pin bandwidth wall really harkens back to the power wall, I don't think it's quite as big of a wall as uh, the um, uh, El Capitan in Yosemite, but uh, something um, more of this scale. So uh, why do we have the power wall, I mean a pin bandwidth wall? Well, in the past when we had uh, single core designs, uh, nowadays uh, we have uh, quad cores and uh, going up to 16 cores with magna coolers of 12. And as we scale the lithography each generation, we get a geometrically increasing number of cores. Now, this wouldn't be so bad except that uh, these cores are all um, pretty much the same in terms of their cache sizes. And, they have the, about the, and they're running at about the same clock frequency, so they have the same bandwidth requirements. And so what you can see here is that the bandwidth requirements are going up geometrically as we scale the number of cores geometrically. So that's the first line in here. Um, as we're looking out to the 2017, 2018 time frame, uh, you could need up to 10 terabytes per second of off-chip bandwidth. And what does the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors say um, as far as uh, the pins that we'll have available? Well, right now it says that we have a maximum of 3,072 signal pins uh, for a high performance processor. Actually, processors today don't have that many pins. But that's the, supposedly the maximum. And that's supposed to scale in 2017 to 3,072 pins. So if you notice a little problem here between a geometrically increasing bandwidth requirement and a fixed pin count, that, that is a problem. But it, it gets worse than this. The on-chip bandwidths need to scale geometrically too. And the uh, interconnect power on-chip is a tougher and tougher constraint at each generation. So uh, the reason for this is uh, you know, imagine you have a memory controller connected to one core over here, and then another core over here wants to access memory that's associated with this, this core. It has to communicate across the chip. So um, I think of this as kind of like the last uh, millimeter problem. Once you get it on chip, you have to actually route it to the right core on chip. And so the last mile problem in telecom. So uh, this can consume a lot of power transiting the chip to get to the right core. And the other thing is that uh, techniques that we've seen so far, like meshes and rings, have uh, bandwidth and latency that vary depending on where you are on the multi-core. So imagine uh, you've got an array of cores, and you want each core to talk to its nearest neighbor to the right and pass some data along. You can imagine that they can all do that in parallel, and it can operate uh, with very high bandwidth and low latency. But now imagine that you have you know, that array of 16 by 16 cores and you want uh, each core to communicate to a random core on chip. Well, there'll be um, uh, considerably longer distances that need to be traveled, and uh, you can imagine there'll be a lot of conflicts um, during the communication. So the bandwidth will slow down and the latency will go up. So that's also an issue for programming. If you want to program a highly parallel machine and use it as a highly parallel machine and not just as, uh, say, a cloud server running completely different applications, you want um, kind of predictable latencies and bandwidths. Uh, instead, uh, if they're non-uniform, it complicates programming, and then you have to worry about the placement of threads. And it gets worse than this because, you know, if you get your program to run for a certain size, say, uh, 8 by 8 array of cores, and then next year you get 8 by 16, and then after that you get 16 by 16, you'll have to perhaps rethink the programming and the placement of the data and the threads each time. So that adds a lot of uh, cost to keeping the software up. And that's kind of the, uh, basically parallel programming is hard enough that we don't want to keep making it more complicated each time. So instead what we'd like is some kind of disruptive technology, kind of like the fairy godmother in a, in a Disney cartoon where we basically come with a wand and, and shake some pixie dust on us and, and fix everything. 
Well, before uh, we look at some disruptive technologies, what are some characteristics of those technologies that will be useful? Well, there's an, an old book by uh, Robert Keyes out of IBM um, that talks about some of the characteristics that, that are useful in a new technology. And he, he talks about many different things, but the two I want to mention here are gain, uh, leading to fan in and fan out, and also a power efficiency. And I know a lot of you guys have a device and physics background, so this is probably um, obvious to you all, but for the, the computer architecture folks here, um, maybe, it, maybe it'll be new. So uh, transistors have good gain, and that means electronics is good for computation. Um, and, but photons in general, this is my basically you know, non-device um, person view of things. Photons don't like to interact so much. So photonics is good for long distance communication, but how long is long? Well, well part of that uh, depends on the device size, which sets the capacitance and the device power. And so in the past, what we've seen is millimeter sized devices for communicating over 30 meters or 10 meters down to one meter. But once we have micron sized devices, we can bring the, uh, basically the distance we can communicate down by, again, three orders of magnitude, just like the size of the devices. Why are fan in and fan out important? Well, it's important for efficient system design. If you think about the old days, there were a lot of bus based systems. Uh, up in PCs up till uh, five years ago, there was the PCI uh, bus before we had PCI Express. A lot of old computer systems were based on buses. And buses can be very efficient from a systems standpoint. But they're not uh, feasible at greater than two gigabits per second in electrical systems uh, due to the reflections and the signal problems, integrity problems that you get off the stubs. But the interesting thing is it's possible to have uh, buses in optics by using splitters and combiners. And so by going back to the, uh, by going to optics, we can go back to these more favorable uh, systems topologies. Uh, we like to avoid point-to-point -point links, which is what we're seeing in many systems, well, in all systems today. Uh, in all cases, uh, because it adds to pin bandwidth limitations and repeated buffering adds to delay and power. And let me give you an example here out of FB DIMMs. Here, uh, some of you may be familiar with FB DIMMs. The idea there is you have a high speed serial I.O. coming out of the memory controller on a microprocessor chip. If you go to the first DIMM, it's got this advanced memory buffer here. And uh, if you're accessing memory on this DIMM, that's fine, it just replies. If you're trying to access memory uh, further out, it goes on to the next DIMM, and you, if it's there, then it gets it fine, otherwise it goes on to the next one, etc. And so you can see that if you want to access something from the last DIMM, and in FB DIMM standard it supports up to eight DIMMs, so there's actually, the DIMMs can go way over here. Um, it can take a long time to go ping, 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 and then back, uh, rattling back and also consume a lot of power as the signal is being received and retransmitted. So this is nice, uh, FB DIMMs are nice in that they allow more memory uh, to be associated with a uh, microprocessor, but they have these bad latency and power characteristics. So this is just an example of why point-to-point uh, -point links are, aren't so great. Uh, if we had a bus and it could actually work at speed, uh, we could go from here directly to this dim over here uh, in one hop and then back again in another hop. So at HP Labs, we've been looking at the applications of optics to computer systems, ranging from where we are now with things like active cables to the optical buses, uh, which were described in, in hot uh, chips uh, and uh, in an IEEE micro arc arc article, and then on boards. Uh, for, say, interfacing the memory, and then finally even using them on chip. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about uh, both ends of the spectrum. And uh, for a lot of people, they know what integrated photonics is. Uh, they don't know what integrated photonics is. I'm sure most of you do. But the way I think about it is it's, it's kind of the pre-noise Kilby era in electronics, where you have individual components and you're, you're wiring them together. And uh, I was talking to, to uh, Dan this morning, and he said he felt you all were at the uh, LSI stage. What we want to do is uh, continue um, driving that and get the benefits that Noyce and Kilby had in electronics from scaling. 
where the components are very small uh, and you manufacture many thousands per die. And as you get advances in lithography, you get better devices. So here's some work that was done at HP Labs on micro rings. I know uh, you're involved in this kind of research as well. And it's uh, something that we're interested in using for dense wavelength division multiplexing on chip. With this uh, one device, uh, we were looking at uh, getting four different structures. Right now, we're not uh, looking at this one so much anymore. But the idea is you can either uh, four different functions. One is just pass through if you're not at resonance. If you're at resonance, you can basically absorb the light. Or if there's a waveguide on the other side, absorb and uh, inject it in here. And then finally, um, either an integrated detector or a detector at the end of this uh, waveguide here. So it's, it's handy having one basic building block and using it over and over in different contexts to, to build a system because it uh, simplifies the amount of engineering effort that's required. Uh, for example, the original Prey 1 computer was just built with four integrated circuit types. So uh, there's a lot of advantages to that in terms of system design. So that's where we want to go uh, long term with the integrated photonics. But let me just step back here and talk about some near-term things that we're working on with the optical buses. So if anyone has any questions, just a point of information, uh, please just let me know. OK, so getting back to the example uh, with uh, FB dims or some other applications. For example, you can imagine boards in a blade uh, chassis. You can have a master device here uh, corresponding, say, in the memory example to a chip microprocessor, memory controller. Transmit out a memory request. That request gets split to each of the items on the bus. They re receive it. If they have data, they transmit back in the slot that's provided by the master in the protocol. And basically, you get reflections off these uh, beam splitters here uh, into the master. And so that's what the, the BSs are for, is the beam splitters. So we've replaced the electrical stubs with optical taps. And uh, we can have our bus structure again, which is very uh, pin count efficient. So if you think about the, the, the IOs here, basically we can, if we didn't have this bus structure and had point-to-point -point links, if we wanted to support full bandwidth to any one device at a time, uh, we'd need, uh, in this example, four times the number of IOs on the master um, because we didn't have a bus. So the approach uh, that we've been doing, and this is work that uh, Mike Tan has been leading at HP, is using hollow metal waveguides as a transmission medium. And the advantage, uh, there's a bunch of advantages there. Uh, low propagation loss. Again, we're talking about distances of, say, a, a blade chassis that, that goes into a rack of about this distance. And it's obviously fast uh, because it's air. And uh, the first design that Mike and his team prototyped was with non-polarizing pellicle beam splitters uh, inserted into beam, the beam path. The other thing that uh, we've been looking at is using, um, if you um, know about skateboarding and you have little skateboard ramps, what we do is instead of the, the beam splitters um, in, in uh, basically the, the channel, we insert uh, little ramps that don't fill up the entire space but just uh, part of the space, and they reflect some of the light up, uh, basically as a percentage of the, the, uh, the channel that's occluded. And so we can change the ratio, change the height of the step at each tap. So each tap gets the same amount of power, optical power. And here's a picture here showing the 1 by 8 fan out of the bus. This is the visible light photograph here with injecting light in this side. And then you can see the taps here in an infrared view all have about the same intensity. And then when we monitor the signal at each tap, we see a very clean eye diagram at each tap. So we get eight wave uh, fan out, and we can get fan in as well. So this is very useful in many uh, systems contexts. Um, it's something that we can build today. And you can build it cheaply if you make it out of plastic, for example. And distance isn't an issue. You can imagine splitting the bus and uh, having one part, say, at the bottom of a rack and one part at the top of a rack if you need it. 
And composite structures such as crossbars are also possible. And uh, so the first application uh, I'd like to bring up are uh, network switch backplanes. So that's something that we're looking at. And uh, you can imagine that um, network switches have uh, high bandwidth requirements in their backplanes because all the line cards might have to go from one line card to another. And using something like an optical crossbar uh, built with optical buses would be a, an efficient way of doing that. Okay, and then I know at, le at least one of you knows about memristors in the audience. <laughs> but uh, another application um, involves memristors, and that's another uh, technology that uh, started with HP and is being looked at in a number of places now. It, if you don't know about memristors, it's a non-volatile RAM technology similar to a resistive RAM, uh, but including a diode. It um, allows a true 4F squared cell, which is the smallest uh, 2D cell you can think about. Five nanometer junctions have been demonstrated. You can fab it in multiple layers like this uh, because, well, easily fab it, relatively easily, because uh, you don't need any active silicon in the stacking. And so it gives you very high storage density. And so when you have this uh, storage density like this, the question is, uh, where should you put it in the system? Now here's the traditional memory hierarchy. We've got on-chip memory in caches, say uh, SRAM. Off-chip memory is DRAM because it's denser and the access time is a little slower, but it doesn't matter uh, further down the hierarchy. Right now we're seeing introduction of flash drives, but they have the same interface on them as disk drives do. And then uh, finally, um, traditional hard disk drive. Well, uh, flash memory has this same interface as a, as a disk drive uh, for a number of reasons. One is it's actually a block structured device. So you can't write a random word in a flash memory. Uh, it's basically a block structured device. So there's some similarities there with the disk. It's also uh, quite a bit slower than DRAM. So although having it on the, a disk interface does slow it down a little bit, it's not uh, as bad as you might think. But if you've got memristors, uh, it's more like DRAM. So you can read them and write them quickly, and you can do random accesses. So it's not a block structured device. So memristors would like to go uh, in this gap here somewhere closer to the DRAM side uh, than the disk side. But just like with disk systems today, you know, we have network attached storage. The old days where every computer had, you know, a little disk of its own and, you know, you'd have to manage the storage and distribute it and everything. That was uh, too much trouble. What you want is your storage in one place and your computation in another place so, so the storage can be shared and everybody doesn't get the same piece of the pie because some servers will need more storage than others and they also need to share it. So if you're going to be storing stuff that you might have stored on a disk in the past in memristors. Where should you store it and how should it be connected? So uh, second possible application of the photonic bus kind of structures are uh, pools of non-volatile memory memristors shared via optical interconnects. You can imagine, for example, a uh, memristor blade in a blade rack um, connected via optical buses and then shared among the different blades in the blade rack. Or similarly, you can think about, you know, putting it anywhere, for example, in a rack and then having optical interconnects to that. Okay, so those are some of the near-term applications that you could imagine uh, using, uh, right now, uh, the Vixels and the optical buses. What about uh, further out things with, with true integration? What could we do in 2017, 2018? Well, what we did a number of years back was we looked at this problem and it, it became you know, kind of apparent right away that what we didn't want to do was take a conventional system you know, with a, a chip multiprocessor and maybe some memory or a chip multiprocessor and a router chip or a network interface and replace the wires on the PC board with optics. Now, I know optics is getting cheaper and, and better all the time, but uh, copper interconnects on a PC board are only a matter of cents, and pins are only cost a few cents. So what you don't want to do is replace something that costs a few cents with something that costs more than a few cents, but it has the same speed and performance. Uh, 
Now, it might just pay a little less power. Uh, that would be good. But basically, you, you don't want to go through all that work and not get a performance benefit. So we don't want to just take systems and think about systems today and replace the wires with optics. That's kind of the wrong approach. What, instead, what we want to do is redesign the multi-core processor from the ground up. And that's what we did in the Corona design study. So this is a design study. It's not uh, a product. And it's, it's you know, uh, nothing more than a study. But what we did instead was look at replacing all the off-chip signal communications with optics, and then also the global on-chip electrical wires with optics as well. And we had a couple of goals with this. First is to restore balance. So we wanted the memory bandwidth to scale with the number of cores. And second, we wanted it to be uniform. So we wanted all memory to be readily reachable from all the cores. So we didn't have to worry about it in the programming it, to make uh, programming as simple as possible. So the uh, system that we came up with in the study was like this, we had a Corona compute socket, and then we had a number of optically connected memory modules here. And uh, they're kind of like beads on a waveguide uh, loop. And they're not like FP dim, so we don't need to transmit to one and then it retransmits to the second. It uses uh, techniques like the optical bus, so we can just transmit to one of them, and then uh, it can respond on the loop. Uh, no matter what position it is in the chain, and the signal comes back to the processor. So this provides uh, 10 terabytes per second memory bandwidth. We have 10 terabyte flops per second of compute performance in the socket. And then we have a, a 20 terabyte per second on-chip interconnect, which can tie the two together. And finally, optical connections to I.O. and other corona sockets. So going into the optically connected memory modules in a little more detail. For the purposes of the study, we assumed you could have up to four ring stops on a stack. Um, each of the stacks could be independent stacks of memory chips. Or you could think about having large memory chips where the ability to have four ring stops means that you don't have to have global interconnects on the memory chips themselves. The global interconnects on the memory chips, just like on the CPU chips, can take a fair amount of power. So I think this is explained in more detail on the next slide. So what we do is we have the light, the light come out from the corona socket. And if we want to communicate to a memory module, we modulate that light with commands and with data to be written. If we want to read back data from the module, what we do is we don't modulate the outgoing light. but instruct the module to transmit back in that time slot. And then it can modulate the light uh, for returning data to the CPU socket. So that simplifies the modules in that we don't need the light sources on the modules. And uh, again, by having the multiple ring stops, we can either have uh, basically one large chip with uh, this provides, uh, the, eliminates the need for global uh, communication on the memory chips, or we, if it's cheaper to have smaller memory chips, we can have multiple stacks. Uh, what we've done is we use dense wave-like division multiplexing, so we can get very high peak bandwidths coming out of a module back to the CPU. And this is uh, very important uh, for the next thing, um, well, the thing after this. Um, again, so we don't uh, you know, receive and retransmit uh, we can go directly through all the modules and back. And we can actually, one handy thing of that is that when we're transmitting, we can actually monitor our transmission on the way, way back and make sure that the signal is going all the way through. So it's kind of a, a reliability check that the, the loop is functioning properly. So the reason why high bandwidth is important is that uh, if you think about uh, DIM, there's uh, typically nine chips on it if you have ECC or parity. Um, some multiple of nine, say nine or 18. And the reason for that is that one DRAM chip can't provide all the bandwidth needed by the CPU. So instead, each DRAM chip on a DIM only outputs a f um, one ninth of the bits. And they're all ganged and accessed in parallel. Now, the, the problem with this is inside the DRAM, the DRAM actually, actually 
fetches many more bits than you need on each access. This wasn't so bad when DRAM arrays were small, but as the density of DRAMs keeps going up and you still fetch you know, a word line in a bank worth of data, the amount of data that you fetch keeps going up. And so with each generation, there's been less and less efficient fetching going on. In the days where we had uniprocessors, it was common if you access one cache line uh, with some frequency, say, maybe 50%, depends on the workloads, uh, you might need the next cache line. Certainly true uh, very, very often if you're fetching instructions, less so if you're fetching data. But now what we have are these chip multiprocessors with each core having multiple threads and in the corona example having 256 cores, so a total of 1,000 threads. Turns out the memory references coming out to the memory controllers are all mixed up between all the threads and they're effectively random. So there's no chance when you fetch um, more data of having the next reference be this, the data sequentially before or after that piece of data that you fetched. So in pretty much, it's always wasted. So one of the things that we did in the Corona study was re re-architect the DRAM chips so they would only fetch the data that we needed. This reduces the density a little bit, but it dramatically reduces the power uh, since right now we're fetching 128 times more than we want. And when you combine it with the fact that we have the eight or nine DRAM chips operating in parallel, we're actually fetching you know, about 1,000 times more data than we need. So this results in much lower system power. Now it turns out you can also make these changes to the DRAM architecture for electrical systems, and I think that's something that's, that's worth looking at as well. But it's something we took advantage of here. So the net result of this is uh, we have low power because we only access the bits that we need. Uh, we have low power because we're using the optical interconnects. And we still provide high bandwidth uh, and get the bits all quickly back uh, to the cores without a lot of serialization delay because of the uh, dense wavelength division multiplexing. OK, so the optically connected memory stack, what does it look like? Well, we've assumed we stack uh, basically the DRAM chips corresponding to roughly a DIMM with some control and interface silicon and an optical die. The assumption is that fabricating the, you know, there's one optical die because the DRAM, you wouldn't have the same optical die on each one anyway. So these are just basically storage cells and arrays, and then we have the interface electronics provided here. You might be able to combine these two in a subsequent generation, but it, it really doesn't matter for the purposes of the study. And then a big heat sink, although it doesn't have to be that big, since we're only accessing a smaller amount of data. What do uh, the rest of the compute socket look like? Well, we have 64 clusters, each one uh, four cores, sharing an L2 cache. A network interface, a directory for cache coherence, and a memory controller uh, connected to an optical crossbar. So as far as the cluster parameters go, for each of the 64 clusters, uh, it's pretty standard, uh, 5 gigahertz. Uh, we think that the clock frequency might continue to increase slowly over uh, the next few generations, but not rapidly like it did uh, during the 90s. Four uh, threads, so four-way parallelism per core and then kind of the standard, other standard uh, parameters. Here it's more simple. We just have the processor die, the memory controller L2 die, and then the analog electronics die and the optics die. So it's a, a thinner stack, which is good because the CPU will require a lot of uh, current, so high current through these uh, three silicon vias. And also its backside is against the heat sink uh, for efficient thermal dissipation. So let me say a few words about the crossbar. The nice thing about crossbar is it provides uniform latency from any one point to any other point in the interconnect. So you can think about the 64 clusters here arranged in an 8 by 8 array, each one of these containing the four cores. We have uh, the crossbar actually looks like a ring. And it's we call it the snake because it kind of snakes back and forth. And then each four clusters come together, and there's a, a ring stop associated with it. And what we're assuming is the light comes from off-chip. Uh, 
and goes around the loop here and implements a crossbar uh, functionality, as I'll show in a few slides. So here's the, the basic snake structure. We have each tile here corresponding to the, the cores and the L2 cache. We have the, the optical hub associated with that uh, cluster. And we have the ring modulators and detectors associated with the waveguides uh, running through there. We also have some broadcast capabilities, uh, some I.O. capabilities, which are simpler. They're just unidirectional, as well as arbitration. And let me just explain uh, arbitration as an example. So arbitration is a common problem in computer systems. You have a shared resource like a bus, a general purpose bus as opposed to a master-slave bus. A lot of different uh, units might want it at the same time. You have to decide who gets to use it. So the way that we do that in the corona study is that we have these rings associated with a waveguide. And we send light down the waveguide in multiple um, wavelengths. Each one corresponds to an optical available signal. And if we request, want to request the resource, for example, the right to transmit to the destination associated with that waveguide, uh, forming basically the 64-way multiplexer uh, which corresponds to 1 64th of the, the crossbar. We, we bring the ring into resonance and we, we pull off the light and then we detect it. And if we detect the light when we bring our ring into resonance, that tells us that w light was coming down here and we uh, sucked it off the waveguide. And uh, so we have the resource. If we're further downstream and we bring our ring into resonance and we don't get any light, in our detector, that means that uh, some other unit upstream asked for the resource, and we didn't get it. So whether you detect uh, light when you bring into your ring into resonance basically tells you whether you have the resource or not. Now, if you look at the electrical equivalent of the circuit, it's it's down here. Uh, you've got an AND. The simplest and the fastest way is to have an AND gate in series at each stage. And then if you re request, uh, you basically prevent the signal from going through the AND gate uh, through this inversion. And then if, the, if it comes in here and you ask for it, uh, you get it out here. So these two gates here we don't really care too much about. It's this gate here. You can see at each stage in the arbitration, if you had, for example, 64 units arbitrating for the right to send to one of the crossbar outputs, you'd have 64 gates in series. So that would be a slow, and it would also consume power. Whereas you can see uh, with this kind of scheme here, we're actually arbitrating at the speed of light as the as the light travels along between all the different different units. Yeah. Right. That's great. Great. Great question. Uh, okay, I don't say it here. But what we do is we actually uh, rotate um, the basically effective position on, on the rings um, at each cycle. So um, the, the, what the question brings up is, you know, if you didn't do anything and you were down here on the waveguide, you'd probably never get access uh, unless, you know, there was no one upstream who wanted us to send. So it would be very unfair. What we'd like is if everybody wants to send uh, to the same destination that you kind of do something that's fair so everybody gets the same bandwidth, which is 1 64th of the bandwidth. So we, what we do is we implement that by rotating, uh, effectively rotating uh, who's first. Yeah, what, what we assume is that we only uh, ever tune uh, half of a wavelength station. So we assume that we have uh, 64 rings to ask for the 64 different resources. 
and that we basically only tune them from basically the, the, the middle of the gap to the, the wavelength that we want. Yeah, we don't we don't believe in big tuning. Or not in our application anyway. Okay, so to figure out uh, what this buys us from a system standpoint, what we did was we com did some simulations and compared uh, five systems using three different on-chip interconnects. Um, one is an electrical 2D on-chip mesh that you might see where you have five cycles per hop. But, you know, in an 8x8 grid, you might need to make a, a lot of hops, you know, up to 16 to get from one corner to the other. The second one was an on-chip uh, 2D electrical mesh with higher bandwidth, but as you'll see, this one has some power issues. We also looked at an optical crossbar uh, that I've described in the last few slides. It provides 20 terabytes per second, and it, it, it takes eight cycles to go from any point to any point, uh, no matter what point. And a combination of, of these, which you'll see on the next slide, with two different memory systems, one, an electrical system using half the I.O. pins, assuming the other half need to go to I.O. devices and other computation sockets, using a 20 nanosecond memory access versus an optical interconnect with um, 10 times the bandwidth, um, fewer fibers, but dense wavelength division multiplexing, and the same access time for memory. Now, the optically connected memory is likely to have a faster access time and other better characteristics, but to kind of do an apples to apples comparison and also to sim uh, basically simplify our simulations, as architects know, memory systems can be uh, complicated to simulate. We just assume the same memory characteristics for both systems. We use some internally developed simulation software as well as the M5 simulator from Michigan, which we're also an uh, open source developer of, on four synthetic benchmarks and a splash two parallel benchmark suite. And what we found uh, is the following. So here there's the five different systems. The, the blue one, which all the others are normalized to, is uh, the lower performance mesh with the electrically connected memory. Uh, it's one by definition. The high performance mesh with electrically connected memory is the light blue. You can see that there's not too much of a difference by using that. The green is the first one using an optically connected memory system. Even with the low performance mesh, there's a few places where that helps out. Uh, high performance mesh with the optically connected memory does better. You can see the orange bars and then the dark red bars are the optical crossbar with the optically connected memory. Now, um, some benchmarks down here, for example, they don't improve no matter what you do. That's because they basically fit in cache. So uh, we didn't you know, delete those from the simulation. Um, in real life, there are some applications that fit in the cache. So higher performance uh, chip I.O. is not going to help. But for these other applications that don't fit in the cache, they show a four to six performance improvement with the optical crossbar and the optically connected memory. Yeah. 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 That's a next slide. All you guys are asking great questions. Um, so here's the power consumption. You can see uh, the red lines are the optical crossbar with the optically connected memory. And in this case, almost all the power is for the, the heating and the tuning of the rings based on our assumptions. And we've since had some ideas which can reduce this, but uh, it was a little uh, below 25 watts on all of these. Uh, whereas the, the power, uh, and that's fixed independent of, of what the bandwidth is that you're doing. Um, you see in the cases where uh, benchmarks fit in the cache, it's actually better to have the electrical system because you don't have the ring heating power. Uh, for other benchmarks that don't fit in the cache. Uh, the power of the electrical systems consumes uh, a lot more. And in the high performance mesh case, just the on chip network alone uh, was over 150 watts. And so uh, what was shown here is that the optical crossbar can reduce the network power uh, for apps that don't fit in the cache by around 6%. I mean, 6x. So you take the 6x here and combine it with the 5x performance improvement, and that's a huge improvement in the you know, speed power product of the network. Okay, so in summary, um, we think that uh, 
optics is promising because it can remove the bottlenecks in terms of a thin bandwidth wall. You can scale the, the bandwidth to 1,000 threads and 256 cores with the 10 terabytes per second off-chip bandwidth and 20 terabytes per second on-chip bandwidth, all with uh, modest power requirements. And even better, we can provide low and uniform latency between cores and between cores and memory to make the programming simpler and still provide coherent and shared memory at a very large scale if that turns out to be useful in terms of uh, programming large parallel systems. So uh, just to summarize uh, the different parts of the talk, one is I think we need uh, more than more. So the, the same old uh, business isn't working anymore. So it's a great time to be working on new technologies. Uh, and emerging technologies can help with both the power wall and the pin bandwidth wall. And I include in that optics and new non-volatile memory technologies. The power wall, it's, it's necessary to reduce both the communication that's done, and that's a job of uh, people in algorithms and in software, as well as reducing the power of the remaining com communication by uh, new technologies. Um, especially for some applications uh, are not amenable to reducing the communication. Uh, for example, um, large graph uh, algorithms basically need to communicate, and so there's not much you can do about it. So you need to reduce that uh, cost terms of power and latency. Um, I think both 3D integration, uh, 3D chip stacking rather, uh, optics and new non-volatile memory technologies are, are all going to play key roles in this. Finally, the pin bandwidth wall. Um, you know, we can reduce uh, the pin bandwidth for some applications uh, that are kind of on the cusp of, you know, not uh, fitting in the cache by having uh, more dense memory. The rule of thumb for architects is that if you increase the capacity of a layer in the memory hierarchy by 4x, you can reduce the bandwidth by half. Those are for things that are somewhat cacheable, at least. Uh, again, the graph processing algorithms, things like that, uh, this doesn't help. So with the combination of the 3D stacking and new non-volatile memory technologies, we can try to reduce the uh, communication bandwidth going off of a module. But uh, we still need to provide more bandwidth uh, for most applications, and especially for those that don't fit in the cache. And that's where optics can play a big role. One of the really interesting things about the optics is that for many years, we've been looking at you know, how can we put components of the system closer and closer together to basically uh, speed it up and also consume less power. And once we've got communication in the optical domain, we don't have to have that anymore. So we can, for example, if we have a non-volatile memory a blade, we can put it in one corner of a rack and have an optical interconnect to the bottom of the rack. And it doesn't really make any difference to the system perspective as opposed to having the, the memory blade immediately adjacent to it. So it opens up new, um, and basically it's freeing to the architects to think about how to configure the systems uh, more flexibly with uh, different components and, and uh, uh, so that's a good thing. And then finally, the optics. Uh, by providing the capability of buses again, it's uh, better than having point-to-point -point links, both in terms of efficient use of bandwidth and also uh, flexibility. So we can address the pin bandwidth wall. OK, that's the end of my talk. Thanks for your attention. No, the caps are all data. So the, the first cap is like you know, 10% or something. And then it, it gets more and more. And then the final one is 100%. Uh, uh, so Yeah, I don't. I don't remember the exact numbers, but we um, we took the, the 
best ISSCC numbers and, and use those for the electrical. Because a 2.2 milliwatt per gigabit per second or something, I think Rambo said some numbers. Well, but there's a baseline density that they're using to calculate. Right, on the electrical side. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, you know, there's the memory arrays themselves. So in conventional systems, you know, the, the memory arrays, if, if you think about a bit being the same size, right, they've been kept getting bigger and bigger as technology has been scaling. And so when you access a word line, you have more things that you read out off of each word line. So we, we can basically fix that by basically having, you know, sub word line selects and doing various things like that. So we f actually uh, activate fewer bit lines. So that doesn't have anything to do with optics. So we get like, you know, the factor of 100 that way. What, the, what we actually do get with the optics is that we don't need to access the eight or nine chips in parallel like we do today in a, in a DIN because we have the high bandwidth uh, path back through the optics. Part, part of the reason why you have to have the nine chips today is cause, because you don't have the, the bandwidth out of an individual chip that you need to supply a, a cache line in a timely fashion. So that's where the optics helps us is basically that factor of 10. The other factor of 100 we get by just making the, the word line smaller and being smarter that way. Yeah. It's, it's basically 64 parallel 64-way multiplexers. Uh, well, there there is some loss when you have waveguide crossings, or then you have to have multi-layer kind of things. Basically, the the, the folks in what I call the in physics lab, which is actually the information and quantum systems lab, but I call them the physics lab. Ray and his folks said, "Don't do that." <laughs> <laughs> so so we didn't. <laughs> if if there's a good way of doing that, then that would be good. It really doesn't make that much of a difference because, um, you know pick up everybody on the same waveguide, you know, we could implement it planar. It wasn't uh, that big of a deal. What, what you can't see in the, that diagram is that it actually kind of, it, it, it comes in and then it goes around and then it, it goes farther towards the inside as you go. So there's kind of different layers of the ring that start at different places to provide the, it's basically 64 different, you know, 64-way um, multiplexers. They all start at a, at a different point. So there's actually, yeah, I should have a picture of it. But most, most people don't, don't ask about the details. <laughs> I can draw your figure afterwards. Yeah, the, the thing that we try to avoid, uh, for, for us what we do is with the arbitration system that we have, we basically select a different output for the, each 64-way multiplexer in each processor clock cycle. And we transfer a cache line in the entire clock cycle. So we don't have serialization delay and we don't have delays to set up, you know, kind of switch some switch matrix. There were, were other um, teams yeah, submitting the unique proposals where they basically had some optical uh, network and they'd have to s send along an electrical signals to wind their way through the chip and then set some switches like, you know, like railroad switches and then you'd basically have to send very long packets, you know, like kilobytes or something and before you could reset the switches again, you know, send like a coal freight train with 100 cars or something. So the problem is, you know, in real chips, you know, you want to transfer cache lines back and forth. And sometimes you want to actually transfer less if it's like coherency information. So you don't want to have these really long packets. I mean, if you look at systems like, you know, um, the IBM, the Roadrunner system, um, 
you know, they have the basically they don't have coherent shared memory, uh, and so you know, they they basically have these long transfers. But then that makes it harder to program. So and similarly, if you had a you know network for these uh, high radix networks, you'd like need to reconfigure it all the time, and you wouldn't want long packets. So. Yeah, what what it is actually, yeah, what it is is actually each um, the clock goes around the snake, and um, uh, the clock goes around the snake. So I don't know if the, as you can see it big enough there, but. Um, Uh, so, uh, so this uh, supercluster here is a little bit sooner, than what, uh, you know, than this one here. It's clock. This one's clock later, and then this supercluster is clock later. That's why they're kind of grouped here. So the the clock travels around here, and so it's kind of like a you know like a V8 engine with different pistons firing at different times, and then we do clock forwarding based on the, the optical clock. So. Basically, we don't have sorties and things like that. We just basically forward the clock along with the data. Right, and this again doesn't show that level of detail. But actually, when we make these corners, we actually compensate for that um, and make sure that all the lengths are actually the same. So there's actually a little bulge that sticks out each time we we turn a corner. Which uh, there's actually two corners in a row here. So there's a bulge that compensates for two corners worth of turning this way. We, we actually turn this way and then back again and then go around. So that's kind of. Yeah, we have multiple channels of clock. Yeah. But it all tra travels around. Well, in, in this study, I believe it was uh, five clock cycles, uh, including including the electronics on on both ends. So I'm not quite sure exactly how many, how much time that is in picoseconds or nanoseconds. That's to go go all the way. Uh, I mean, it's uh, yeah, that's the worst case kind of from any node to any node. <laughs> well, we had a really good time during the study, and now we have to make it real, which is kind of a, <laughs> you know, you always really have a good time the first three months or so, and then. <laughs> yeah.